recording. All right, so we are recording right now. And so we're gonna go back to political point numbers just a little bit, okay? So one thing I just want you guys to kind of look at, because you know, this is related to today's lab. So understanding this part can be helpful. So what I want you to take a look here is what if I multiply this portion, okay, let me use a mouse pointer so that way it's recorded too. So what if I am to multiply this portion by two to the power of 52? Well, you know, the net result is, you know, if I multiply this portion, this entire thing in the parentheses by two to the power of 52, it becomes an integer. How do I know that? So I multiply this portion, everything in here, by two to the power of 52, the result is gonna be an integer. So how, how do we figure that out? Well, <clears throat> you look at the range of i, okay? So i can range from negative 52 to negative one. So obviously negative 52 is as low as i can be. So that means you know, this power of two is two to the power of negative 52 when i is negative 52. So that means if that is multiplied by two to the power of 52, what do we get? What happens when you multiply two to the power of negative 52 by two to the power of 52? They cancel each other, and you get one. That's exactly right, okay? So, but that's gonna change the value being represented because you know, what we want to do is to figure out what value we have represented. So we can uh, basically subtract another 52 from here, okay? So instead of having a negative uh, minus 1,023, we can have a subtraction of 1,055, is it right? No, 75, sorry. So we change the offset here to 1,075, then we can turn this whole thing into an integer. So the bottom line is we are now specifying the sign. The sign is easy, okay? If the sign bit is a one, we have a negative one. If the sign bit is a zero, we have just a one. So that's the sign. We have a gigantic integer here, which has to be at least two to the power of 50, um, let me see, 52. And at the most, you know, two to the power of 53 minus one, okay? So that's how this portion can be. And then this portion here is still just you know, some kind of power of two. In other words, a floating point number, okay, a double, is really just a quantity of some power of two. Are we okay with that concept? Because that's gonna be, you know, what your lab is based on, okay? So the, the lab today is really another look at floating point numbers from the mathematical side so that we understand you know, what it really is talking about. Now, looking at this view is important because this portion here only has 52 significant digits, which means there are only two to the power of 52 ways to represent this value, as opposed to an unsigned 64-bit integer where we have two to the power of 64 representation. So that means, as far as precision is concerned, a double actually has less precision compared to a 64-bit unsigned integer, even though the range of value it can represent is huge. That's mostly because of, you know, we multiply this you know, the integer part here by a power of two. So the power of two over here is more or less like a unit, okay? If you think about this part as a unit, it can be a very small unit, it can be a very large unit, but nonetheless, the highlighted portion is nothing more than just a unit. Whereas, this portion here is specifying how many of those units do we want to uh, include in order to represent the value that we are representing. So I want to kind of emphasize that, you know, because that's basically another look, or another way to look at a double or otherwise known as an IEEE double precision floating point number. So today's lab is kind of you know, looking at a double like this way. And by the time we get to close to the end of this lecture, I'll give you guys you know, more 
ideas of how to do the lab today. All right, so with that said, we are pretty much done with double representation, and we are now moving on to a whole new section. I know from your perspective, you, you don't see all of this stuff here, but I'm skipping a lot of things just so that it, you know, we, we end up with more time doing the programming things that I think you know, we should be focusing on. So we are now going to defer flop and other basic memory devices, <clears throat> which is this module. And the first thing it introduces you to is, okay, the prerequisite of uh, module 0281, which is basically the thing, the stuff that we talked about at the very beginning of this entire semester, the NAND gate. So I hope you guys still remember the NAND gate, the negated AND gate, okay, which is basically the same thing as performing a conjunction and then negating the result of the conjunction. So we are going to, you know, I will talk about, you know, the SR latch, okay, you know, it looks a little funny because I'm using, you know, kind of like a C program-ish code in order to represent the circuit. But before we go there, we are going to take a look at what is the von Neumann architecture, or uh, as, as I was corrected, it is supposed to be pronounced as von Neumann, von Neumann architecture. Okay, so this is a, I would say, an interesting side you know, uh, topic. You know, if you look up John von Neumann, okay, and go to the Wikipedia page, it has a pretty good introduction of him. Um, and if you want to, you know, if you want a picture of a genius, okay, this is the picture of a genius. Because most people think about Albert Einstein as a genius. Well, there's a difference between Albert Einstein and John Barney. If you look at you know, what he's good at, okay, so we'll just go ahead and take a look at you know, what he's good at. He was a Hungarian Amer and American mathematician, physicist, computer scientist, and engineer. So he's not just a physicist or a mathematician, which is basically what Einstein was, okay? He basically, he's, he is STEM, okay? And he also contributes, you know, significantly to every single field that he was, you know, he was studying. So when you look at, you know, what he, he has, what he has made contributions to, it includes mathematics, physics, economics, computing, statistics. And if you ask anyone in each one of these fields and ask, so who's the best person in this field, they will all point to him. So that is what kind of a genius he was you know, when he was alive. I believe he and actually, uh, he and Einstein overlapped a certain period of time at, Stan at Princeton University, um, which is kind of interesting. If you want to read some of his backstory, uh, because he's Hungarian, um, and as a result, you know, he likes polka music and play it loud in his office. Albert Einstein, on the other hand, prefers you know, his environment to be quiet so that he can focus on your know, thinking. So you can kind of imagine the, the kind of hallway conversation between those two. Um, he passed away really early, okay, and that's probably why we don't heard of him you know, too often, is because you know, he passed away when he was only 54 years old, okay? Now, I understand, you know, that's back in the 1950s, but even so, people usually live up to, what, the 70s and the 80s, even at that time. So he passed away because of cancer. Um, a lot of people believe that that was because, you know, he was involved in the hydrogen bomb, you know, experiments, and he got exposed to radiation, okay? So if he did not pass away that early, I think he would have contributed even more just like Alan Turing would have contributed a lot more if he did not you know, either pass away or commit suicide, depending on you know, who you believe in. But anyway, you know, we have a lot of geniuses okay, in um, computer science you know, who passed away too early. Anyway, so related to this class, okay, what is his contribution? It is difficult for us to understand his contribution because we have no idea what computers look like and how they were quote unquote programmed before John Barney. So I'm gonna give you a picture of how computers used to look like and how it is programmed and then hopefully you guys will get a basic understanding of 
Wow, okay, so maybe he does contribute a lot. So we'll look up computers, wire, wrapped, and I'll you know, throw in the time period, which is the 1950s. And typically, this is, uh, we can just go for images, and this is colorized, and this one you see what it used to be. We'll just take a look at this one. And see if I can magnify this picture. There we go. All right. So <clears throat> by today's standard, this radio here is a program. Because the behavior of a computer is dictated completely by how components are physically So you can see there's a whole bunch of bundles. So every time you want to quote unquote reprogram a computer, what it involves is you have to disconnect a bunch of wires, look up the schematic, and then rewire those components as specified. Is, are we doing okay so far? Okay, you know, I, I don't really think that we in this generation can truly appreciate you know the convenience of not having to physically rewire anything on your cell phone in order to reprogram it. I mean, you guys just have to stay on Wi-Fi or you know, stay on 4, 5G and it's over the air updates, right? Most of the time you don't even notice it. Your phone will get, you just get the job done without you noticing anything. Just imagine, you know, if computers were back like that, okay? <clears throat> Every time you want to upgrade your Android or iOS, you have to take it back to the shop. Somebody has to open the phone and with microscopes, <laughs> take out those tiny little wires and then reconnect all those tiny little wires. So because of this, okay, we have computers that are actually quote unquote programmable in the sense that we understand. So you can type your code in C, C++, it compiles into object code, but the object code is living on a hard drive or flash drive or HDL. Um, uh, solid state you know, drive. And then when the program is about to run, what happens is the operating system will take that file, put it into RAM, do a few adjustments, and then it will execute. That is super easy compared to what people used to have to do. Now, just not too long ago, because you know, that's when I went to college, um, I did not get to the point where we had to use punch cards, but I had to submit jobs. Okay, you know, I had these you know, really dumb terminals. I typed in the program, and I can only get a print out of what the program is supposed to do. There's no actual output on the screen itself. Um, and then the editor is what we call a line editor. You can only change one line at a time. So it's not like you know what you guys are used to, you know, VS Code, okay, totally fancy with syntax highlighting and all that stuff. Nope. We edit one line at a time. Yep. All right. So, given this context, let's find out you know, what is uh, John Bonneman's or you know, um, contribution. So, even with computers like this, okay, it has memory. It has computer memory. It has what we call a core memory, because in order to finish the computation, it still needs memory in order to store the numbers. Uh, a typical application of a computer like this was in a naval application because you know, they were used to calculate uh, shell trajectories. Okay, um, I'm going to guess that they pre-computed the shell trajectory based on the amount of powder behind and then the kind of shell and then you know, when they're on a ship you know, they actually have a huge lookup table of you know, what shell, how many powder behind it and you know, what is the elevation and how far it's going to go. So they pre-compute all of that stuff using these computers. But the bottom line is, if you're computing the trajectory, you still need some kind of memory in order to understand, okay, this is the uh, elevation of the shell, you know, this is the, what the drag of air, this is the uh, ballistic coefficient of the shell, and so on and so forth. So John Bonneman's art contribution is basically one little thing. What we would think as a one little thing but from his time, it is not one little thing. He's basically saying, what if we 
utilize the very same memory used to store the data to also store the program. So instead of having the program specified by how things are physically connected, he's thinking, what if we were to store instructions in the very same memory that we use to store numbers and data? And then we can have the computer to go to memory, go to those instructions, decode the instructions, and then figure out what I'm supposed to do next. That was his contribution. So to date, okay, the computers that we use, okay, which includes every laptop computer, every smartphone, every you know, watch okay, that you have, they are all of the von Neumann architecture. It is so common that we typically do not even mention the ages of von Neumann architecture. Is that okay so far? Okay, yes. Sort of. Yeah. Yeah. So an FPGA, which is Field Programmable Gate uh, Array, okay, FPGA, P Field Programmable Gate Array. That's that's it. So that is a little bit different um, because an FPGA does not have the same density as an actual processor processor, because an FPGA consists of you know like a bazillion NAND gates or a bazillion NOR, NOR gates, okay. And then they have routing resources, so they can basically dictate the output of this NAND gate goes to the input of this NAND gate over here, and so on. The routing is the issue, because on every single processor, routing is a resource that is scarce. That mostly has to do with chips or two-dimensional <coughs> designs, okay? And you can only go from one place to another place without crossing paths. You can only do so much you know, when it comes to routing. So when you try to implement a processor using an FPGA, yes, you can do that. You can probably do it to a fairly advanced your processor. Not today's you know, i5 processor, because those things just have super density. Let's figure out the density. But the bottom line to answer your question is, um, when you use an FPGA to implement a processor, um, you are losing the density that otherwise you know, would be on a regular processor. So your chip would get a lot bigger and power consumption would go up as well. But FPGA is good for things that are in flux, okay? Such as um, your voice encoding, okay? When you talk on the phone, you know, the voice encoding, you know, that is an algorithm, but it can also make use of peripheral hardware to kind of speed it up so that your main processor on your phone doesn't have to do, you know, all that work. Because when the main processor needs to do specialized math operations, it is actually slow and inefficient. So an FPGA that is specialized to do the same kind of calculation is much more you know, power efficient, and it is also faster. More, you know, it's, it's just better. So you're, you're, so you're basically delegating the function back. Yep. Person. Yep. But the nice thing is the FPGA is field programmable, which means it's not only field programmable because it's RAM based. So, so that means you know, it can change quote unquote on the fly when you're without a reboot of, of your phone. Yeah, in theory, at least. So when we look up the density of a processor, so we'll just look up Intel i5 uh, number of transistors. It's insane. Um, they are, this is the 14 nanometer, so we'll look up the current generation, which is five nanometer. Seven nanometer chip is estimated to have 115 million per square millimeter. Okay, so can can you guys imagine how small is one square millimeter? Okay, how many of you use mechanical pencils? Okay, and what is what is the size of your lab? Is it a 0.7 or 0.5? 0.7. Okay, so let's say it's a 0.5. So you put two lead right next to each other, okay? That's the width of one millimeter. So if you uh, turn that width into a square, that's one millimeter square. Within that space, okay, within that area, we can fit 125 to 300 million transistors. That's a lot of transistors. <laughs> 
Okay, so that's partially why we don't use FPGA to implement everything, because when we do that, you know, we lose the density that we can put into these processes. So did that kind of answer your question? Oh, the other one, okay. So, really, really interesting stuff here, because um, if you have an Apple, like a, mo like a more recent um, Mac, uh, they basically, they put the memory and the processor onto the same chip. And therefore, one, it is smaller, it consumes less power, and three, it is also faster. Because the actual distance, the traces between the processor and RAM is so short that they can access RAM a lot faster than a, in a typical design like this or a typical laptop, I mean a desktop computer. So, really interesting stuff. So, but everything goes back to, you know, what is a memory device? You know, how do we store information on a chip, okay, using NAND2 gates, right? You know, because you know, we know that we, use, we can use two P transistors and P two N transistors to make a single NAND gate. So we want to kind of think about, so how do we make something that can remember something just using NAND gates? So that's what the, this particular um, uh, section is talking about. So over here, we have a text description of a circuit, okay? So I will pull the circuit up, you know, because you know, the other class has done this already. So I think I still have it. I rebooted my computer, so maybe it does or does not. You guys cannot see it yet. I may not have it, but that's okay. We'll just kind of look it again. Okay. All right. So it doesn't want to go to here. There we go. All right. So when you look at the circuit uh, description, okay, this is the circuit description. This is basically saying that okay, if we look at NAND2 as a class. We have two variables, N1 and N2, that are objects or variables of the class NAND2. Is that okay? So I'm just borrowing the syntax from C++ or just about any object-oriented programming language. And then we have two input pins. One is called R and one is called S. And then the other one would be output pins. One is called Q and one is called NQ. So what is even kind of slightly more interesting is how we can add a node to the circuit. So we basically imagine the circuit is a variable already declared to represent the entire circuit. So now we can add a node. And what a node really is, is it connects multiple components. So in this case, the input pin S and the first input of N1 are connected. Okay, so we basically are specifying a path or a conductor between those two pins. Some of these pins are a little bit more complex. So like this one here, it, is, it has three connection points. It connects from the output of N1, which is the NAND gate, to the first input of N2, but it also connects to the output pin Q, okay? So that's just a textual way of representing a circuit. Now, we haven't really been using this way of specifying a circuit because it is much more intuitive to use larger sim and we can, we can look at the actual diagram. But in reality, we don't actually use larger sim to design an entire processor because an entire processor has trillions of transistors. And if you reduce trillions you know, into logic gates, we're still talking about at least hundreds, if not more, of you know, logic gates, hundreds of millions of logic gates. So can you imagine trying to fit all of that into a single diagram like Logisim, it's not going to happen. Okay, even with multiple levels of abstraction, it is still not going to happen. So that's why you know we use you know text to descript text description to describe a circuit. There are two critical programming languages to specify you know how components inside a processor interconnect. One is called VHDL. The other one is called Verilog. So if you are planning to transfer to UC Berkeley for their computer science program, you're going to have a final year project of enhancing a processor in either Verilog or VHDL. So this type of description of a circuit is going to come back, you know, in the final year of Berkeley, at Berkeley. 
All right, so let's go ahead and make this circuit. Okay, so we'll go ahead and go to LogiSim, and we're just going to make the circuit. Uh, the circuit needs two input pins. So here's one input pin. I'll call this one S. And then we'll have another input pin. We'll call this, this one R. And then we'll have two output pins. One is called Q. And I don't really know why you know, the uh, output is called Q. And NQ I know because it's just the negation of Q. All right, so now we need uh, two logic gates. So two NAND gates, okay, so here's a NAND gate, but I don't need it to have five inputs, so we will reduce that to only two, and make it a little bit smaller, just so it, just so that it looks nicer, okay, that's it. And then we'll duplicate that, and now I suppose we can space out the components a little bit more. Let's see more of that here. Okay, there we go. And then we just make a circuit. Okay, so that's that's the that's this part is easy. So it's this part here. So nothing really too special compared to what we usually do. And then here comes the weird part. The weird part is we take the output of one and we put it to the other one. And then we do the same over here. So this is a little bit weird, okay? Because it looks like we're gonna have an quote unquote infinite loop here. Because you know, the output of this goes to the input of this, and then the output of this goes back to the input of that. So it looks like uh, this is kind of like an infinity symbol kind of infinite loop because it, it crisscrosses like that, right? So now we have to learn how to analyze you know, what, what this circuit is going to do. So what I'll do, one more thing, okay? We'll name this one as N1, you know, NAND gate one, and this is gonna be NAND two, N2. The top input pin is known as input pin zero. The bottom is input pin one. Okay, so that's just a naming convention. All right. So now we want to analyze what this circuit is going to do. And there's a very specific way to do that. So what I'll do is I'm going to reduce the zoom here. Okay, not that much. And maybe one level down like that. The reason why I'm doing this is because I want to use a spreadsheet to keep track of you know how things are being changed in this circuit. So here we have open in this program and always on top. Okay. And I'm going to oh let me okay. I forgot to do one thing first. Sorry, give me a second here. I'm gonna reset simulation, turn it off and then reset it. Because I don't want all of this stuff here to distract us. Okay, so now it's better. Let me do that one more time. Take a screenshot. Like so. And put it always on top. All right, so that's good. And for now, I don't need LogiSim anymore. And what I do need is a way to kind of keep track of you know how the signals are getting changed. So I'm gonna use a spreadsheet to do it. So I will put this at a location that you guys already have access to, which is the shared drive. So if you go to the shared drive of this class, and you know, once I name it, you guys will find it easily. So we'll have a new spreadsheet, and I will name it under today's date, okay? So 2024-0923. Now you can find it already. Um, if you go to the shared drive, <clears throat> okay, so let me optimize this just a little bit. We we'll get rid of this stuff here, and then put this all the way top. Okay. All right. So the way the circuit is represented in something like this is a little bit obscure. Okay, it may look a little obscure. So what I'll do is I'm gonna name every connection point. Okay. So we have S dot pin as a connection point because it is the pin of the input pin, okay, the connection point of the input pin. R dot pin, you know, once again, it is the connection point. And then we have N1. N1 has a few things. So N1 has um, input pin zero, which is the first input pin. It has the second input pin, which is in bracket one. And it also has an output pin, N1 dot out. And I'm gonna, change the size of the columns a little bit because you know, otherwise 
gets a little it, 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 it get a little wide okay so I'm gonna shrink it a little bit like so and the n2 is the same thing so we have n2 dot in bracket 0 that's with the first input pin or the top input pin n2 dot in bracket 1 the bottom input pin n2 dot out you know that's just the output pin of n2 and then finally we have the two output pins q dot out which is an output pin and then n q which is also just an output pin there we go so once again you'll shrink the columns a little bit because otherwise it's not about you know, whether, whether i can fit the whole thing on the screen it's just harder to track the columns when they're too wide all right so now i need to represent how things are connected so i know that s the s input pin is connected to the first input pin of n1 so they will share what we call the same node so i would use zero to identify that particular node in other words every node has an id which is basically just a number okay so r is going to connect to um, the second input of n2 so if this is node number one then this also belongs to node number one and now we have um, the three connectors okay so we are looking at the output of n1 it goes to q it also goes to the first input of n2 so now we look at n1 dot out let's call this node number two it goes to the first input of n2 it also goes to q and then the rest are node three so n2 dot out and q and the second input of n1 are all connected so this is my way of encoding connectivity you know of a circuit using just numbers in a spreadsheet are we doing okay so far with this okay so sometimes i would use you know, color coding you know because you know, when we only have four nodes you know like in this case color coding works really well but in the exam i typically have like seven nodes or or more it becomes really impossible to differentiate between the shades of green or the shades of blue. So instead of doing that, you know, using numbers is always going to work. How do you know just from looking at the gates between the two gates? Between the two gates? Right. So we have N2 going to N2, right? We're looking at that connected one to one next to two. Okay, so you have to you have to call out which pin of N1 or N2 because we have in zero here, in one here, and out here. So, so N1 has three connection points. N2 also has three connection points. So you have to tell me which connection point you're referencing. So what, so what I'm saying is that it goes from N1 to X2, right? How many each have it? Uh, N1 to what? N1 to X2. To Q. So N1 goes to Q right here. But it also goes to right. the the first input of N2. So when you look at N1 dot out, it is belonging to node two. But node two also connects to the first input of N2. It also connects to Q. So that's why the first the, all the numbers of row one are significant because each individual number, each unique number, identifies a node, which is basically the connectivity between the pins. Okay. All right, so now we you know, basically just have an initial condition. So the initial condition is easy, okay? We just assume that we know nothing about this entire circuit. So everything is unknown, okay? Are we good so far? All right, so now we can we imagine, okay, that you know, both input pins are gonna be zeros, just like you know, how it is displayed here. So that means you know, right here, we have a change from z uh, unknown to a zero, we also have a change from unknown to a zero for R and S because those are input pins and the end user can change the value of input pins. I will also label this particular row as NC, which stands for con uh, node connectivity. In other words, what we are trying to do for this entire row is to say, um, if we know that node zero is a zero and node one is also a zero, what other pins are going to be known? Uh, what other pins will also change at the same time? So the way we do this is we track down S dot pin. Okay, where where does it connect to? 
we look at the node number, it goes to node zero. So who else is on node zero? Ah, I see one over here. So that one is also gonna change to a zero over here. Same thing for um, the input pin R. It is changed from a question mark to a zero. It belongs to node one. So now we ask who else is on node one? Ah, we see one over here. So this is also going to change to a value of zero. So I am going to pause a little bit here and see if there are any questions about what I just did. While I just make these a little bit wider so that the close bracket is visible. There we go. All right. All right, questions. So are there any questions about what I'm tracking and what an NC row is trying to do? It uses node connectivity to figure out who else needs an update. Hmm? What? Nope. Well, okay. Even though it does not do that, you can. That is true, but for the most part, you know, everything is just logical too. So when you when you're in Logisim, the you know, one thing you can do is to use the poking tool, because if you use the poking tool to poke a particular node, it highlights the entire thing. So now you can see how N1's output connects to Q. It also connects to the first input of N2. But otherwise, there's no color you know, highlighting. There's no color coding. Now, just because you know, Logisim does not have color coding does not mean that you cannot you know, color code the whole thing. So if I were you, and I'm more visual, and I like to use colors, I would make this circuit myself, okay? And then print it out and then use you know, whatever highlighter, you know, use like a four color type of highlighter, use a yellow, pink, green, and blue, okay? And then highlight this, okay? Just because your know, Logisim cannot do it does not mean that you cannot. Are we good, good so far? Okay, so don't let the tools limit what you can do because you can be inventive and use your know, highlighting methods that the tool does not support. All right, so getting back to the spreadsheet, okay. So now the next item is called a PD. Okay, so let me explain what a PD is. I'll go back to Logisim and make a new circuit. This new circuit does not really, you know, it's not useful for anything other than just looking at the diagram. So we go to here, we pull a transistor out here, and I'll even zoom in so that we can take a closer look at the transistor. If you have taken electrical circuit, either as a physics class or as an ET electronics technology class, do, do you remember a device that has like two bars like that, except you know, it has a connector up here and just a single connector down here? Let me draw that on the whiteboard and see if you guys recognize it. This is the non-polarized version. And this is the polarized version. So what is it? Hmm? It's a capacitor. Very good. Okay. So a transistor actually has a quote unquote capacitor that is quote unquote built into it. Now, do we want a transistor to also act as a capacitor? The answer is no. Okay. But it, does it act like a capacitor? The answer is yes. It acts like a small capacitor. Very small, but still a capacitor. The wiring connecting all the components, they have a certain resistance to it. So with a capacitor, the best way to imagine that is a bucket, okay? It may be a very small bucket, maybe even just a coffee mug, okay? And then a wire that is going to charge or change the voltage of a, a capacitor is kind of like a hose or a straw, okay? If it has a lot of resistance, it's more like a straw, if it has very little resistance, it's more like a garden hose, okay? So, does it take time for a garden hose to fill up a coffee mug in the backyard? Don't do it at home. The answer is yes, okay? It does take up a little bit of time, okay? If you were to turn on the garden hose to pull, okay, and then you use your, your um, what do you call that, nozzle thing, okay? 
in front of Philip or talking about, you know, it will take a very short amount of time. Okay, I'm going to guess like a fraction of a second, but it still takes time. Okay, it's the same thing over here. So that means from the time the gate, okay, which is the top pin here, changes the state to the time the flow changes at the same as a result of that, there's a certain lag in between. Because until the capacitor portion has changed the charge, it doesn't affect the flow. If you were to turn it on, okay, from the off state, it takes a little bit of time. If it's already on and you want to turn it off, it also takes a little bit of time. So there's a certain lag of what we call a proper si proper bit from a propagation of delay associated with a transistor turning on and turning off. Are we good with that idea? There's a delay. For those of you who are gamers, okay, there's a lag time. <laughs> okay? It's an uh, unavoidable lag time. So because a NAND2 gate is made out of you know, transistors. So that means a NAND gate overall also has a lag time. So let me you know, describe what that means. So I go to gates, and actually the other diagram already has it, so let me just go back to the other diagram. So main, there we go. All right, so the lag time of a NAND gate means you know, from the time any one of those two input pins changes state, it takes a certain amount of time before the output pin becomes the correct answer. Are we good with that? Okay, so that is called a propagation of delay. So now, when we go back to the diagram or the spreadsheet, okay, so after a certain amount of propagation of delay, I'm expecting certain things to maybe change, okay? The reason why I'm expecting that is because this is a change of the input pin of N2, N1, and because one of the at least one input pin of N1 is being changed, I'm thinking maybe the output could change also at the same time. So now we go to this output here and ask, after a certain amount of propagation of delay, are we expecting the output of N1 to change? What do you think? So, so there are a few questions embedded into this question. Okay, the first one is, is it going to change? Okay, it is, is it going to change in a way that we know how it is going to be changed? That's the number one question. The second question is, Jack, you haven't really taught us about how to analyze this sort of thing. No, I have not, because it's just logic. I have given you the knowledge already to figure this out. Okay, the question is, can you utilize the knowledge that you already have to solve this problem? Okay, do we know? how the output of N1 is going to change as a result of the first input pin of N1 changing from unknown to a zero. All right, so how do you solve a problem? Something like this. Without using Google, without using chat GPT, and without asking anyone. You look up. It's so because if you look at N one and you have a zero, you then connect the zero, but you just the N one now is the zero and you connect the zero because if there is a change in the state. Well, it has to do with the behavior of NAND a NAND gate or the NAND operator. Okay? The question is if I know one pin or the one of the input or one side of NAND two is a zero, can I make any conclusion about the result of NAND? So the first thing you need to remember is, what does NAND do, okay? So at this point, okay, I'm not even concerned about the two N and the two P transistors. I just need the truth table, okay? That's the first item, is the truth table. So the question is, do you remember the truth table of NAND2? Yeah. Okay, very good, okay. So that's a good starting point, okay? So the starting point of a NAND gate is, you know, okay, I'm going to make a table here. So we have, you know, variable input U, input V, and then we have, you know, the NAND operator here. So the, the, do you guys remember what it looks like? What is the NAND operator? What does it look like? Uh, 
That's what we talked about in the very first class of the semester. Okay. There's no such thing as negative. It is either a zero or one. Huh? Negated? No, that includes the negation. This operator is the same thing as the negation of u wedge, which is the logical and u. That is in the very first. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. Which in C code, okay, I'm going to give you the C code too, just so that we uh, we cover all the bases, right? So it is the negation of u ampers and d. Okay, so I think with this, nobody should have any questions about it anymore. Okay, so, but it's a truth table, so let's go ahead and actually make this a truth table. How many rows do we have in this truth table? Four, very good. Okay, so the first row is zero, zero, okay. So when u and d are both zeros, what is zero NAND zero? One, very good. And then the next row is zero, one. And what about in this case? What is the result of NAND? It's also true, very good. And the next one is one, zero, one, very good. And then the last row is one, one. It's a zero, very good, okay. So, the next question is, okay, so now we have the knowledge, okay? But how do we use this table to solve what we just saw? So, what we saw, okay, let me describe what we were trying to figure out, which is in the spreadsheet right here. So, what we see here is one side of NAND being a zero, the other side is still unknown, and we're trying to say, do we know the output already at this point? So the question now is, how is this table going to help us? We know one side, let's say, let's just say that u is known to be a zero, but we have no idea what d is. Does it matter? Because whenever u is a zero, the output is a one. Whenever u is a zero, the output is a one. What d is does not matter at all. Okay, so let's, let me just kind of pause here to make sure everybody is getting this point. In an end, okay, whenever at least one side is a zero, the output is a one already. I don't need to know what the other pin or what the other side is. Does that work? We good? Okay. So that is the reason, okay, why we can go back to the spreadsheet here and go like, yeah, we don't know what the second input pin of N1 is, but we can already determine the output of N1 is going to change from whatever it was, okay, which I don't know, to, to a zero. Is that okay? We good? Okay. So I can use the same argument and put a zero over here. Now, every time on the PD row, you know, the output of something changes state. So in this case, the output of N1 changes from an unknown to a zero, and the output of N2 also changed from unknown to a zero. So that always necessitates another NC, because we not we want to figure out, okay, now that we know that node two just got changed to a zero, we want to figure out uh, who else is on node two? Oh, okay, the next column is also on node two, so that also needs to be changed to a zero. Oh, by the way, node three also changed. Oh, okay, I forgot one, one more, because there's another node two all the way here that is also going to be a zero. No, I, okay, I made a mistake. You guys didn't catch it. There, th these are supposed to be ones. <laughs> yeah, all of these are ones, but I'm not done yet because you know, there's another node three over here that is also supposed to be a one. There's another node three here, which is also supposed to be a one. So I think now we got it, okay? Yep. Are we doing okay so far? You know, what is the role of an NC and what is the role of a PD? Yeah, N2 out is also one. Denoted on the PD because it is after a propagation of the delay. I have already done so. 
is already okay. in the modules. Yep. It's the module right after the one that we are reading. It's already described. All right. So now, because the NC row is also not blank, now we also need to do another PD. In other words, some input pins that got changed. Okay, this is an input pin. So is this one. The output pins we don't really care. Okay, because they just go out of the circuit. Somebody else is going to pay attention to that, but not me. So now we look at this and go like, hmm, the other input of N1 just got changed from some unknown to a one. Uh, what about the output of N1? Is that going to change here? What do you think? What do we know about the two inputs of N1? Yeah, one is a zero. Ah, uh, we know the other one too. It is a one. Does that change the output from a one to zero? Nope. So if it is not changing, we leave it blank. Okay, we just leave it the way it is. Same thing over here. Okay, the output of N2 is not changed because you know it still has at least one of the input pins being a zero. So that means you know the output of N2 continues to be a one, and we don't put a one over here. So unless it is a change from what it used to be, we don't put a you know, we don't put anything down. So but we are done. This entire PD row is blank. Is that okay? So we are done with this analysis, and we basically call any row of PD that is blank, we call this a steady state, S-T-E-A-D-Y, state, because it is not, there, there are no further changes, you know, as it is right now. So until I change one of the input pins, this circuit is stable, it's not changing anything. Are we good so far? Okay, all right. So now I will go ahead and change one of the two inputs from a zero to a one. So in this case, I'm gonna change um, S dot pin to, from a zero to a one. So I have NC over here, I'm gonna change it to a one over here. Okay, so now we have to ask that question again. Who else is on node zero? Okay, this is node zero. This is also on node zero. So that means, uh, okay, the first input of N1 also need to be changed to a one. But nobody else is going to be affected because there are only these two on uh, node zero. I'm going to maximize here just so that we can have more space here. And just in case, I can move this over here, but I don't think I will need to go that far. Okay, so now we have another PD because every time you have at least one input pin changed by NC, this time you change input N1 dot pin zero to a one. Now we have to go through a PD, which basically asks a question. After a propagational delay, is one of the components going to change its output? Well, okay, first of all, which component may potentially change the output? We only got two components here, N1 and N2. And one of them is staying put because none of its input got changed. So which one is not gonna change? For sure. N2 is not going to change for sure because when you look at the two input pins of N2, it was not changed by the most recent N0. So that means N1 is the only one that I'm concerned about. In other words, I go to this space here and I ask, uh, because of how we change in zero of N1, is the output of M1 going to change as a result? Look at the truth table. When both inputs of an and is one are ones, what do we get as an output? It is zero. So it is a change. Now, because one of the output pins got changed, that means we have another N zero. Because the output of this N one is connected to node two. So everything else on node two will also change to a zero. So we know this is gonna change to a zero and that is gonna to change to a zero as well. Ah, we just made a change to one of the input pins of a component, so that means uh, we have to take a look at the PD. After a certain propagational delay, is N2 going to change its output? So this is N2, this is the output of N2. The question is, should I put something over here? 
because we got one zero to begin with, right here, this is zero, and it's, it's still there. So that means the output of M2 is still going to be a one. If it's not a change, if it's not a change, we don't write it here. Is that okay? So, but that's it, right? Because M2 is the only thing that might have an output being changed. So that means, once again, we have a PD row that is empty. So that means, we, once again, we have our steady state. Is this all going, o going okay so far? All right. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Control X, Control V, there we go, thank you. All right, so one more thing, okay? So I have another NC here, and this time I decide, well, let's change R to from zero to one, okay? So because that belongs to node one, we look up everything on node one and say, okay, you are being changed to a one too. And then we go to a PD. Now, the reason why we go to a PD is because this belongs to one of the input pins of a component, which means the output of this component potentially is changed. But is it? What do you think? So we are looking at the output of N2. N2 currently has the first input being a zero, the second input being a one. So what should be the output here? It should still be a one, but it has been a one since row five. So that means it is not a change. If it's not a change, we don't put anything here, and then we declare this entire row also a steady state. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay, so this is a very step-by-step -step approach of analyzing how changes are being propagated within a circuit. So, let me duplicate sheet one, because you know, I'm gonna make another one where the sequence is kind of opposite. In other words, instead of changing s.pin to a one first, I'm gonna change r.pin to a one first. Basically, this one goes here, this one goes here. And I wanna figure out you know, how the rest of the circuit is gonna change. So what I do is I just need to erase this bunch of stuff because the first part is still the same. And this is getting a one here. All right, so this time I will do the analysis really fast, okay, because it's the same kind of analysis, except this is like just a mirror image of what we had. So this is node one, this is node one, so that gain, that changed to a one. This N2 can potentially be changed, and it is changed, because both inputs of N2 are now ones, so that means the output of N2 is going to be a zero. That zero belongs to node three, so everything on node three, and also this one, is gonna get changed over here. And then after that, because this is, it's because this one is also an input pin of N1, it is a zero now. But since this zero is still here, so that means the output of N1 continues to be a one, which we already had here. So there's nothing for me to say. So that means this is an empty uh, row for PD. You can do copy paste <clears throat> and then I changed this to a one it belongs to node zero this is also on node zero change that to a one this is one of the input pins of n1 so I have to look at this and ask is n1's output going to change the answer is no it is not going to change because this is still a zero which means the output continues to be a one so that means we are done with this analysis. Copy and paste. All right. So now we are done with two sequences of changes. The earlier one changes s.pin to a one first, and then it changes r.pin to a one. This one is just doing the opposite order. They go like, okay, what is the big deal? The big deal is when you look at the output pins, this one ends up you know, with a zero in NQ, a one in Q. The other one has exactly the opposite. This one ends up with Q being a zero and NQ being a one. Hmm. So when, if I were to draw a, a truth table for this, what is that gonna look like? The truth table of an SR latch is a little weird, okay? 
So we have S as an input, R as an input, Q as an input, and Q as an, excuse me, Q as an output, and Q also as an output. When the inputs are zero zeros, oh, okay, I need to turn this into a table, which means I need uh, to do this, okay? So when both inputs are zeros, we know the outputs are going to be one and one, okay? That one we know, okay, for sure. If we change one of them to a one, like so, we know that in this case, um, let me see, uh, this is going to have Q being a one and Q being a zero. And if we do the opposite, which is a one over here and a zero here, then we're gonna have zero for Q and one for NQ. When we have both ones here, this is the one we go like, uh, I'm not sure what to put into these cells because in one case it was a one zero, in the other case it was a zero one. So what am I supposed to put here? What do you guys think? I'm checking to see if you have read ahead of the class. <laughs> because this table is already in the notes, okay? So as I said, it is important to read ahead of the class, okay? They are called NC, but NC does not mean no, no connectivity in this case. NC in this case means no change. Whatever it was, it is maintained. Are we doing do okay so far? So this NC is no change. It is not no connectivity. Are we good so far? No change. Okay, so what is the other way to say no change? To maintain the current value? To remember the current value? Yes? Memory. That is why the SR latch is the most basic um, unit of memory inside a computer because it has the ability to remember what it was when we changed the input pins to one one from either a zero one or one zero of SR. Is that okay so far? Okay, so I'm gonna take roll. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a very short break. You know, so I can take roll first. Okay. So we go to course. I have to change the time of the road taking activity. So this is 2024-0923. So give me a second here to change the time. Yeah, gotta change that. So we'll change it to 45. And the passcode is, we just scroll by really fast, Johnny, J-O-N-N-J-O-H-N-M-Y, Johnny. So you can publish, you should be able to see it now. And I'll write the access code on the board, J-O-H-N-M-Y. All lowercase. <clears throat> and then you guys are doing the road checking activity, I'm going to switch back here and see if there are any questions. No questions? Yeah, go ahead. is correct. So as a non-graded assignment, okay, I'll give you this, okay, so I'm going to go to, well, I can make a copy of each one, so copy, duplicate, so become a copy of copy of each one, not surprisingly, okay, 
So I'm going to give you this as not so much a homework assignment, but I would like you guys to kind of think about it, okay? What if I were to change both input pins to ones at the same time, right at that point? So your job is to first finish row eight, finish with the node connectivity, and then keep going until you are convinced that you know what is going on. Okay, so this is not a homework assignment, okay? I'm not gonna collect it or degrade it, but it is something for you to do because this is this one is interesting, okay? You will find out why I say it is interesting when you kind of get around to do it. But th it does give you an opportunity to practice you know, doing this stuff here because that's gonna be in the next exam, not exam one, okay? Exam two is gonna include a question where I give you a more complex circuit compared to what we are seeing here, but what you need to do is to track down, you know, how things are being changed. Or, you know, I can give you a trace that's partially done, and then you guys would have to tell me what are the missing pieces, or I can give you one that is wrong. There are certain things that are wrong with it, and you have to fix it. But in any case, it will involve something like this. You have to track down how things are changed in a circuit. All right, so with that out of the way, I am going to remind the class what we are going to do on Wednesday. Because when Wednesday comes, what I'm going to do is I will talk about exam one, the one that I gave you from way back. Um, and it will go through some question number one and three and four. Question number two is not relevant because we did not talk about borrow, look ahead, subtractors. So that one you don't have to do. But question number one, three, and four are applicable to us. And I also want to kind of tell you guys that double is still also on in our scope. So there, there are no questions on double with the exam that I gave you. So I can give you um, the exam two from last semester, which has one question of double. So I will also give you that too. In fact, I'm going to give you that one now. So let's do it right now. You can look up um, my, okay, I'm gonna just write this first. Uh, exam two only with double matters. C attached. And then now two. It's in the right folder, so it's x2-000 PDF. I believe it is the last question. So now you have exam one, question one, three, and four, and then question number, number three from exam two. So those are all relevant to our exam one. All right. Do we have any questions regarding exam one? Because I'm not sure I want to you know, kind of move forward with the memory devices, or you know, you guys want to at least you'll know, get to start to talk about exam one. I'll go ahead and talk about exam one since nobody has seems to have any preferences or none has expressed. <clears throat> So this is the actual exam from last semester. The fact that I give you this means your exam is not going to be the same, okay? So do not make any assumption that, oh, I, my exam is going to look like this. Nope, it's not. Um, we'll go over your know, part of this first, okay? So make sure that you write down your name, okay? Um, you can just write down your student ID if you don't want to write down your name, that's fine, but write it in a legible way. Okay, there are many cases where I cannot tell whether you know, something is a one or a seven, or whether it is a zero or six. Okay, you know, some you know, penmanship. Okay, just focus on the penmanship, at least when you write down your student ID, so that I can tell who you are. All right, um, paper-based content that is prepared prior to the exam can be used as long as there's no interaction or collaboration involved in the exam to answer questions of the exam. In other words, okay, I'm trying to understand, I'm trying to be my own bad student and go like, okay, 
is this when you're looking at a piece of paper, I will send it to you, and if you write down your answer, you can pass it back to me. Because technically, it is still on that piece of paper, I should be able to use it. So this basically says no. Anything that involves interaction with another person during the exam is not going to be allowed. Okay? If I want to be a bad student, I think I can be a very, very bad student. But I never felt the need to become one. Um, do not share or discuss any part of the exam with anyone in class or otherwise until the next class meeting or otherwise I say it's okay. Okay, it's because some people may not be able to take the exam on the day of the exam. If you are on DSPS, please make arrangements accordingly. Okay, so they need about a week ahead of time. So that means, you know, even if today is a good day, okay, you go to the DSPS you know, center and then arrange for your exam um, arrangement or accommodations. Um, grading is based on the explanation of end steps, demonstration of the understanding of knowledge and problem solving skills and not the final answer. So that means, you know, with at least some of the questions, I need you to show me the steps, okay? How do you come up with the conclusion? If an earlier part of a question is answered incorrectly, partial credit may be given to a later part. So some of these questions have multiple parts, like a lot of parts. Um, so in those questions, okay, depending on how wrong the earlier part is and how it affects the later part, some people may be able to get partial credit, even though the earlier part was wrong, but the later part was consistent with the earlier part of the wrong answer, okay? But it depends, okay? I cannot say that there will always be partial credit. Um, sufficient explanation means your answer connects definitions and concepts discussed in class via logical or mathematical steps to find the answer of the question. In other words, I, in some of the questions, I want to see how you make connections from what the question is asking, what we have talked about in class, and how you use cortical logic to glue everything together. Okay? <clears throat> You can write your answer on the exam itself. However, feel free to attach additional sheets of paper if necessary or if that is your preference. Some people really prefer to have the exam question on the piece of paper and they don't touch it and they have a separate piece of paper to write down all the answers. You can do so. If you bring extra pieces of sheets of paper, I would advise you to write your name on each one before the exam. So you would, you would not be using exam time to write your name on the extra sheets of paper. Um, and it is also, you know, some people also like to use grid paper because it, everything is lined up. So you know, that's another reason why people want to use their own paper. <clears throat> All questions carry equal weight. Now that is important too. Because let's say there are four questions, which I have no idea whether we'll have four questions or not, but we'll assume that there are four questions. So let's say there are only four questions. How do you answer the questions? What is your, your technique of taking an exam? Easiest one first, right, exactly. And then you also want to time yourself, okay? Let's just say that it really is four questions, okay? You have 80 minutes, okay? So 80 divided by four is 20 minutes, easy. So if I were you, I would time myself and only allow myself up to 15 minutes per question. So that means when I'm done with all four questions, I would actually have some time left. Then I would use that time to go back to an earlier question that I might not have finished completely or I have, I have some doubt about my, 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 my answer. Why do you think I want to do something like this instead of I'm just going to start with the easiest question and until I'm done with that question, I'm not moving on to anything. Why, why the strategy of always timing myself so that I have a chance to answer every single question? Yeah, Yep, exactly. So there are two factors. One is how many points are you getting per minute of time, okay? 
after a certain you know amount of time on a single question, that ratio goes all the way down. Okay, you can spend another hour, and the amount of points you're getting in extra is not really that much. So that's one reason. The second reason is in the attempt to answer another question, it might remind you of how to answer an earlier question. That can happen as well. Okay, so there are multiple reasons why you want to kind of at least have enough time to answer, try every single question at least a, for a little bit, and then give yourself a little bit more time at the very end so you have some time to kind of review and also reattend to the ones that seem to be more uh, difficult. All right, and I'll give you some notations, at least with this particular version. Um, this is the lo same as logical and, this is the same as logical or. In this class, a Boolean, you know, you, this plus means an or in a Boolean context. And then what looks like a multiplication is logical and. Um, logical, I mean, operator priority is the same as that of C and C++, except for uh, the additional exclusive or, which has the same priority as or. Does everybody understand when I say operator priority? What does that mean? It means if I don't use parentheses, what is performed first, okay? So if I say something like this, okay, let me go to my document here, okay? So if I were to say, okay, this is an equation, um, let's just say that A and B or C, okay? The question is, what, what happens first? Am I going to perform A and B, take the result of the conjunction, and then, use, and then or, that's the, or the result of the conjunction with C, or am I going to perform the disjunction first and then use the conjunction to and the result between A and the result of the disjunction? That is the question. In other words, if you look at this in C and C++, because you remember C and C++ is the prerequisite of this class, right? So that's why I can make assumptions of what you should know already. And I'll talk about you know, what if you don't know yet, okay? because there's always that. Okay, so this is the equivalent expression in C++. The question is, how do we interpret, interpret this so that we know, you know which operator goes first? Okay, so let's just say that I barely remember anything from CISP 360. What should I do? That's one way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> or I can do this. Just look it up. <laughs> but this is a part of what you need to prepare. Okay, what I want to emphasize is you have time, okay, to prepare all of this. Okay. If you cannot remember certain things, okay, you have a memory, you know, you know, leak, okay, and you go like, I cannot remember the truth table of this operator. You have plenty of time to look it up, print it out, put it you know, on the pile of stuff that you want to bring with you. Personally, I would not just print stuff up and just kind of staple and bring it with me. I would manually copy everything that is of importance from wherever it comes from on a piece of paper so this way, I go through the process of writing it. Because if I go through the process of writing it, there's a much better chance I may not even need it to begin with. And if I do need it, I know where to find it. Okay, so that's my recommendation. You know, you guys can do whatever you want, but there's certain you know, limitations as to you know, what you can and cannot do in the exam. All right, so getting back to the exam, which I cannot remember where I put it already. Uh, not this one. Oh, where did I put it? Right. Okay. It's in here. Okay. So question number one. Okay. I'm not sure how many of you have tried to answer question number one. How many of you have tried? So this has to do with tables. 
and the definition, okay? So when we look at, I think this one is a binary, what, subtraction? So what you need to do is to put all the definitions in one place. How is Q of I defined in binary subtraction, okay? So you have to remember Q of I is R of X, I, Y, I. But what is R of X, I, Y, I in a binary subtraction? Oh, R of something is just the exclusive or something, okay? That is what you need, okay? So when you are trying to answer these questions, you might need to read things again, okay? In other words, you might find it necessary for you to go back to some of the earlier modules that we have already talked about in this class. That it really is the whole point of the exam that I'm giving you. It gives you a scope and it's not easy, which means you know, in the process of trying to answer those questions, you may find, oh, I totally forgot how B is defined in a binary subtraction. Then look it up, okay, look it up write it on a piece of paper that you are going to bring with you to the exam, okay? This is how I envision people will be doing when they're prepping for the exam, when you already have an actual exam from last semester. Are we doing okay so far with all this? All right. So I know I sounds like, it sounds like I'm nagging a lot, okay? And that I am, and that's because I'm a dad. And my son just, I just dropped off my son at, you know, in San Diego over the weekend. And I have to nag him a few more times, you know, just, you know, right before I left, okay? But he's the one who told me he was inspired by other students who are also transferring to UC San Diego. One particular student already had two internships and got a recruiter to, you know, try to talk him into working for yet another company. So my son was really impressed and he looked at his own GPA and go like, you know, that I, I could have gotten a better you know, GPA if I played less game and put more focus in studying and actually reading the material ahead of time before class and getting more ready for the exams. So that was his, that were, those were his words, not mine, okay? So that's the reason why I'm you know, nagging people. Because in some way, I look at you guys like my kids, my children. It may not be a good thing, okay? I just want to emphasize that may not be a good thing. But it's something that I tend to do. All right. So that's that. And we are going to get started with today's lab. Okay. So today's lab is the second lab for floating for numbers. And that's going to be our last one, too. And it's... Hmm? On the test? Yeah. Is it better to identify each variable what there was going to be a zero or one in there and answer? You have to do it in that order. So the, that order. So the problem is with that one is you have to do it in the specific order. So that means you know certain things I tell you ahead of time. In in fact, in this particular one, I cannot guarantee it's gonna be the same as yours. I tell you exactly how to do it to be fine. So and then I proceed to tell you B6 or pi as the initial condition. So that's why it says no need to explain this is given. Okay, so no need to do anything on your part. So everything from one to 11, you do not have to do a single thing about other than reading and understanding what they are. So you're saying that if you're assuming, if you look at uh, line number five, you can define that, right? Because you already have the zero and then you have the zero. Okay, wait, 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 okay. Go a little slow. <laughs> From line five, you, you mean you mean this item five here? Yeah. This one? one? What about it? You already have to find two variables. Um, I only tell you how D zero, Q zero, and P zero relate to each other. Right. I do not give you any one of those five until here. So here I tell you what is D zero, I tell you what is Q zero, and you have to figure out the rest. Well, you have to do it in the order that you specify here. 
So line 12 is the first line that you actually have to figure out. So the question is, how can I know that the negation of x1 and y1 or the negation of d1 and g1 is true? Why? So the because should link to 1 to 11. You know, at least one item from 1 to 11, so you, you know, that's where the because is going to be, it's going to look like. And then just by whatever or the other one, whatever. Whatever, it, whatever they are, they are supposed to be, okay? But I can tell you that you know, there's no, guessing is not going to work in this case, okay? So you really need to know the definitions and how the individual bits relate to each other and also the truth tables. So all of those things come together to basically figure this out. This is, uh, this is also, by the way, the easiest version of this kind of test question in the history of me teaching this class. Because the other version is just open-ended. <laughs> I give you a binary addition or subtraction, I fill in certain ones and zeros, and you have to figure out the rest. This one gives you the correct order already. You just have to figure out why can I make this conclusion on line 12 using everything that I have already figured out from line one to line 11. So it takes studying, okay? You know, I can tell you that there's no amount of, I mean, that kind of goes without saying. It just, it just takes a lot of studying and understanding how things work. All right, so getting back to today's lab. This is today's lab. It is called floating point two. I'm gonna make it visible and give you the access key. The access key is EXP for exponent. Right here, EXP. All right. Now, since you guys have access to it already, I will give you a few clues because I don't want to answer the same question multiple times. The first question is really just solving for this P, so use algebra to solve this. Um, and then for the second question, the second question, you know, the only thing you have to be careful about is this is finding the round of x divided by 10. So it's not just x, it is x divided by 10. This is the floor of x divided by 10 and not just x. So that's the second question. Oh, okay, that's not what I want to do. Next one, question number three. Question number three is asking if I have one, if each unit is two to the power of negative 20 in this question, and the amount that I want to estimate is x, which is 4.659 times 10 to the power of negative three. The question is how many of these units would best estimate this particular value? In other words, Imagine, you know, I have to make a change for $13.96, okay? And all I have are quarters. The question is, how many quarters will best estimate the amount that I'm supposed to have as change? The last one is going to be the most difficult. Or, well, this is, there are four questions, there are eight questions, but they are in groups of four. So this is the last of the entire group. For this one, it relates to what we just talked about very beginning of the class, which is basically saying a floating point number is basically a certain quantity multiplied by a certain power of two in order to figure out the value. So if, if you ignore this part, D, the value being represented, is some kind of quantity x, which is an integer, multiplied by two to the power of some you know, exponent, okay? But there's an extra constraint here. The extra constraint is x, which is the number of power of two, has to be greater than or equal to two to the power of 52, but it has to be less than two to the power of 53. So the question is asking, what is this p? I don't even care about the x. I only want to know what p is supposed to be that value. So this is the answer, okay? This is how you can figure it out, or one way to figure it out. So one way to figure this one out is to make x exactly the same as the lowest possible value it can be. Then you solve for p, okay? You solve for this p because x is two to the power of 52, 
you only have one unknown and the key is already given to you, so you can solve for this key, which is going to be a irrational number. It's going to be something point blah 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 blah. Okay? Just write it down, okay? Up to like two digits. Then you make x as large as you can possibly get. In other words, you make x the same as 2 to the power of 53, and then solve for this key again. It's going to be another irrational number. So the nice thing is the two solutions for p are two irrational numbers, but there's only one integer between them. That integer between the two solutions for p is denoted. So that would be the easiest way to figure this one out. Okay. So the next four questions are basically the same kind of question, but repeat it you know, just one more time. All right, so I'll let you guys go ahead and do this. I'll go get some water to drink, and then I'll be back. <clears throat> oh, I need to turn off the recorder and upload the lecture recording. <clears throat>